I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with the legendary Frank Marshall, the director of the HBO documentary, The Bee Gees, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? Uh, first question I guess I'll ask is, uh, you know, what were your first memories of the Bee Gees? Was it their stuff from the late 60s or was it more towards the Saturday Night Fever era? It was really the Saturday Night Fever era. You know, I, I was um, I was making movies in the 70s and I actually ha happened to be at Paramount in those days. I was making The Warriors, which is another sort of New York uh, centric uh, movie. And um, as, as um, I forget who says it in the in the doc, but it was you know we knew there was this little disco movie going on over on the stages, and uh, with John Travolta, who was a TV star at that time, you know we thought oh, that'll not amount to anything. And little did we know that the Bee Gees were hole up in a chateau in France creating this incredible music. So you know when. Uh, you know, when, when you make a documentary like this, you know, there, there are oftentimes things that, you know, can be incredibly compelling, but for one reason or another, you're just not able to include it in the film. Were there any aspects of the band that you found really fascinating, but for one reason or another, weren't able to include in this documentary? Well, there, there are a couple of things, you know, they were in the, they were in the Sgt. Pepper's movie. And, you know, I thought that was interesting, but it really didn't drive the story forward. It was offered to them. It wasn't something they pursued. And, and you know, but I, I you know, listen, Sergeant Peppers um, and, and them being in the movie, playing the Beatles, it was kind of crazy. But I didn't have time. There was so much that they did and so many stories to tell of their ups and downs and how they survived you know five decades and and had hit records in all of those five decades that um i had to leave some things out so uh how did you end up uh deciding to make this documentary about the bg so did you just did, were you just like listening did like state alive come on the radio and you were just like man we should tell a story about these guys because they're incredible i wish it was like that things just happen you know they kind of fall in your lap it was being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I grew up uh, out here in the valley. I, I'm actually in Toluca Lake right now. Uh, I grew up in Van Nuys and my dad was uh, a composer, arranger, guitarist, um, and he was under contract at Capitol Records. And so I spent a lot of time as a kid at Capitol Records and I got invited about five years ago to, and Capitol Records kind of went downhill and the building got, you know, kind of old and decrepit and and uh, the new CEO, Steve Barnett, invited me over after he had refurbished the building. And I went and visited, and we were sitting in his office on the top floor looking out over Hollywood and talking about documentaries and music documentaries. They were starting up again. They were going to make one about Motown, and it was really about introducing people and reintroducing people to old music catalogs. And I said, well, you know, what do you got? And he said, well, we just bought the Bee Gees. And I went, wow, I love the Bee Gees. How about we do that? And that's kind of how it started. And, and Barry Gibb was coming out because the Grammys were doing a, uh, a show honoring the Bee Gees. And Barry was coming out a couple of weeks later. So we met in that same office and we hit it off. We had musical families, we had connections and you know, we just kind of bonded. And that was five years ago and we just went forward. So in, in making this movie, did you find out anything uh, about the Bee Gees that you found genuinely surprising? Or uh, did you, and also, uh, I also want to couple that with the question, how much did you know about the band going into this? Well, I didn't know any of the details. I, I did know, um, you know, obviously they were brothers. Uh, I actually didn't know that Morris and Robin were twins. Um, and that was a little bit of a surprise, but what surprised me the most about them was their sense of humor. I, because you don't see that in the band on the stage, and, but when they're off stage and they're back, they're cracking jokes, they're playing games on each other, they're playing games in the interviews on, on the hosts, and they just had a great time. And, and I think that's part of the family bond that they developed as brothers. They had this dream when they were nine, 10 years old that they wanted to be a band. 
and they, the perseverance and the drive that they had and their parents supported them. And that family unit was really interesting to me because um, you know, they immigrated to Australia and came back to London. You know, that, <laughs> what parent would do that today? Would you know, stand behind your kid who wants to be part of the British invasion? And, and then moved back from Australia. So there were some amazing things that I found out about the early days with them, but what I was really surprised about was all their humor. I loved it. You know, it's interesting you bring up uh, the, um, uh, you bring up uh, this, the, the resurgence of uh, music documentaries. Um, and uh, you not only have been, you know, part of uh, directing them, but you've also been part of producing them, including uh, once about, you know, uh, Johnny Cash and Frank Sinatra and an upcoming one on Paul McCartney with uh, the incredible pro uh, producer Rick Rubin. Um, right. I, I'm curious in more in, in, in sort of like a general view, how has uh, music, pop music, rock music shaped your life and your career? Um, it's been a delicate balance for me. I, I do feel that if I hadn't done movies, I would have been in music. Um, I've played guitar my whole life. And as I said, my dad was a guitar player. We had music all the time at our house. Um, we had musicians over all the time. And so music is, is just a, an incredible part of my life um, and has shaped my life. I mean, I, I really pay attention to the songs we put in our movies, to the, the composer. I love going, my favorite part almost of making a movie are the scoring sessions. Um, I was lucky enough to also grow up with Johnny Williams. He was a friend of my dad's. Um, so, I, you know, he's done so many of our scores. Composers like um, Jerry Goldsmith and James Newton Howard and Michael Giacchino. I mean, I, I just love that music part of things. And as I say, if I wasn't doing this, I would be doing that. And uh, just for clarification, by Johnny Williams, you do mean uh, legendary composer John, John Williams. I've never heard him referred to as Johnny Williams before. Yeah, you know, it's the, the, those of us who've known him our whole lives call him Johnny. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to take that as an open as an I'm going to take that as an open invitation to if I ever meet him. Probably not. But if I ever do, I'm just going to call him Johnny and I'm going to say you said it was OK. Yes. Please be my guest. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it, what's another thing that's really interesting, I'm, and I'm looking back now at also at your career in general, um, is that uh, you had this amazing relationship uh, professionally with Kathleen Kennedy, but it's also a personal relationship. And I was curious uh, because she is your she is your wife. And I was uh, curious as to, um, did, uh, did you, were you, uh, at first, uh, professional together and, uh, then, uh, you, you got married later on. Uh, how, how did the relationship come about? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's essentially it. Um, I was, you know, I made movies, uh, I started making movies in 1967 and really in 1970, I, that became my career. Um, so when we worked on Raiders, which I now realize is 40 years ago, like this week or something. Um, <clears throat> I was, you know, married to the movies. The movies were what I did 24 seven. And I never thought I'd, I'd find somebody who loved making movies as much as I did. And that could be a partner. But when we started working on Raiders, Kathy was there and she was Steven's assistant. And we all became friends. Uh, and as you know, it, which turned into a company, uh, Amblin Entertainment. And, um, you know, we became friends first and we started working together and uh, that eventually, uh, you know, we fell in love and uh, we've been married since 1987. Wow, that's incredible. 33 years, or 34 years now this year. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, you, uh, uh, you've been a producer on many things, um, uh, including uh, you've been nominated at the Oscars five times uh, for Best Picture. Uh, what is that experience like going to the Oscars, you know, nominated for, you know, the best movie, other than, you know, having to wait until the end to find out? If, if it, you until this year. Um, 
it's a little scary. It's really nerve wracking. I mean, you're, you're trying to, you know, I, I don't come from, I'm not like Tom Hanks who can just off the cuff give these great speeches. So, I, you know, I would write out so I didn't forget somebody's name. I would always be ready. <clears throat> but it's kind of nerve wracking. It is a group of your peers. It is the people that, you know, they're, I'm as awed by a lot of these artists and movie stars and writers and directors as, as you are. And in being there with them and being nominated with you know four other great movies, uh, it's kind of intimidating and uh, nerve-wracking. Um, so and then you, you you can't go out in the lobby and get a glass of wine because you're the last award. So you have to maintain your sobriety until that last moment. So it's kind of a rough three hours. <laughs> but then I'm guessing you know once that's presented you're hitting the bar at the governor's ball. Oh, yeah. Everybody's celebrating because you're celebrating with everybody. And, you know, I know it's cliche to say it's nice to be nominated, but it is really nice to be nominated. And that's enough. You know, the, the fact that you're getting recognized by your peers is pretty great. Well, uh, you know, it's not not only are have you been uh, nominated for Best Picture, you've also uh, received one of the highest honors that a producer can receive when you uh, received uh, the Thalberg Award in 2018. And uh, also, I was curious what that experience was like. Well, that was, that was just amazing. Um, it was such a wonderful, warm night with all of our friends there and a celebration of all this work and the people that we have done the work with. I mean, making movies is a collaboration. So to be honored for something like that and to be the first couple and Kathy, the first woman, um, was was pretty extraordinary. Um, just a wonderful evening. Did you? Uh, and I, I am curious as to did you like the the format of uh, having the whole evening for the honorary awards uh, as opposed to what you were probably used to being an Oscar audience member of just like you know the uh, you know little presentation you know that's like only five minutes. Did you yeah. like that whole evening? Absolutely, because, you know, we had a couple of presenters, which was great, and there were other people honored with us. And the, so the reels were long and relaxed, and we were relaxed, and we got to say what we wanted. You know, when you only have 45 seconds, you can't thank everybody. You can't say what it meant to be working on these movies with different people. and you know we're a family so you want to acknowledge those people so it's really special there's no pressure there's no television you know you just have a great time so i'm all in favor of that format well frank uh thank you so much for joining us we wish you all the best over uh this upcoming emmy season and to all of our viewers please like this video smash that subscribe button and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the gold derby app to make your predictions thanks so much Okay, thanks, Charlie.